So guys, usually you just have to draw the graph. So they, I mean, they don't often ask you before drawing the graph to state whether it's a local maximum or local minimum, but you never know what can happen, right? So it is nice to have all four options written down. So like I said already, you must look at the shape. This is the, the quickest way because you only actually need your A value and your X values of the turning points for this. So we remember that if our A value is positive, then the shape will look like that. So that means that the lowest X value will be your local maximum turning point. And the higher X value of the two will be your local minimum turning point. If you just think of the shape and we're thinking of the X axis. All right, so if this is the case, then lower X value will be your local max and the higher or bigger, I'm not sure what the, <laughs> the better term is here. The higher X value will be the local minimum. But if your A value is negative, it's obviously going to be the other way around. So then you will have a decreasing graph at the beginning. Now if we're looking at that shape, we can see that the lower X value in this case will be the local minimum. And then the higher X value, so that's on there, would give you your local max. Right, so guys, for this method, you need the fewest pieces of information. You just need to know what A is, is it positive or is it negative? And you need the X values of your turning points. All right, so this would be the quickest method. The second one is where we look at our Y values. All right, so I'm going to write here y coordinates of turning points. So for this, you would have to go one step further. If you have your x values, you would actually have to sub them into the equation, get the y values. All right, but then the lower y value <coughs> is your local min. And the higher y value would give you your local max. Okay. Then there are two specific methods. They could technically ask you, like they did in the, the um, homework use the first derivative test or the second derivative test. So we're just going to write it down. So the first derivative test so that we need to understand that the first derivative tells us what the gradient is. All right. If your first derivative is positive, your gradient is increasing right if your first derivative is negative your gradient is decreasing so let's write that down um if dash x positive then for that section where the first derivative is positive you will have an increasing function <clears throat> and for the section where your first derivative is negative it will be decreasing. <laughs> now, guys, if you're being asked to do to use this method, it doesn't really matter whether your shape is whether your a value is positive or negative. I'm just using that as an example. 
this point over here, if we're just looking at this graph, this point, this turning point would be a local maximum. Do we agree? Right? So that would be local max. Now, guys, a local maximum will always be where you're going from an increasing gradient and on the other side, you have a decreasing gradient. Right? A local maximum will always look like this, even if your shape is, whoops, sorry, the other way around. The local maximum there is still between a positive gradient and a negative gradient. I hope that makes sense, right? Local maximum is always at like, what do we call that? The crest of the curve, all right? So the gradient on the left-hand side of the local maximum will always be positive. It has to come from an increasing part. Then here, what is the gradient at the point? Zero. And on the other side of the point, it will be negative, decreasing, all right? So let's write that down. Local max. <clears throat> You will have this situation, basically. I'm gonna do a little number line. We have our f dash x equal to zero there at the turning point. On this side, your derivative will be positive. And on that side, sorry, that's a very funny looking plus. <laughs> on that side, the derivative will be negative. Right, I hope that makes sense. I'm just gonna say it again, a local maximum turning point is always like at the top, all right? So on the left of that turning point, your gradient, in other words, your first derivative will have to be positive. And past that on the other side, it will have to be negative, right? So guys, this is literally what you'll do. We'll do it now for an example quickly, but you will actually do like a little number line. All right, and you'll have your x value of your turning point, whatever it is, then you'll sub in an x value on the left, and you'll sub in an x value on the right, and then the signs that you're getting will tell you whether it's a local max or local min. Okay, for local minimum, it's going to be the, uh, the opposite way around, the other way around. So let's just say that that is our local min. And guys, a local minimum turning point will always look like that, regardless of the shape of the graph. On the left hand side of the local minimum turning point, your gradient will be decreasing negative, or your function will be decreasing rather, so your gradient will be negative. And on the right hand side, your function will be increasing, so your gradient will be positive. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have our turning point where the derivative is zero. On the left hand side, you will get negative values if you're subbing this x value into the derivative. And on the right hand side, you will get positive values because that is where the graph does not go up again, where it becomes increased. Yes. Yes, but if they ask you to use the first derivative of this, then you can't do that. Yeah, so this, it seems a bit, it seems like a lot of work for when you can actually just do one of these two. I agree. But they might ask you to use the first derivative of this. But um, so they don't tend to do like Yeah, no, I've never seen it in an actual exam. But you never know. Disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> All right, then number four, the second derivative test. Now, guys, we know that the second derivative has to do with the concavity of a graph. All right, concavity. So if your second derivative is positive, then your graph is concave up. And what will that look like? Something that's concave up looks like that. Now guys, if this section of the graph is concave up, you're subbing in 
So x value of your turning point, right? And you're getting that your second derivative is positive. What turning point will this have to be? The local minimum, because that means that it lies on a concave up section of the graph, All right? So then, sorry, let me. So for the second derivative test, you don't have to do a number line, all right? You literally sub in the x value of the turning point. You sub it into the second derivative. If it's giving you a positive value, that means that it lies on a part of the graph that is concave up. So it has to be a local minimum, all right? It will lie on that part of the graph. I hope that makes sense. Then the other way around, if you're subbing in the x value, you're subbing it into the second derivative and you're getting a negative value, that means that it's lying on a part of the graph that is concave down. So like that section over there, right? So then it's concave down. So it looks like that. So it will be that point up there. So therefore it will be the local maximum turning point. Okay, so the second derivative test is actually quicker than the first derivative test because you just sub in one value. For the first derivative test, you have to sub a value on the left and on the right, okay, to get the different signs. For the second derivative test, you just sub in that x value of the turning point, you sub it into the second derivative, and then based on the sign, you can tell whether it's a local max or a local min. Okay. Shall we quickly look at one of those that you guys did for homework? Let's look at number four. <clears throat> I'm just gonna write in this book. <clears throat> okay, so number four, this is number four. They asked you here to use the first derivative test that we'll do first derivative and second derivative just so that you guys can see, all right? Oh, sorry, this thing is... I'm just going to write on the side here. If you have space, you can also just write it in there. So first derivative test. All right, to use the first derivative test, you obviously need the first derivative. But guys, you've got that when you calculated your turning point. Right, to get the turning point, you make the first derivative equal to zero and then you solve for x. So what was the first derivative here? Let me see, it was negative 3x squared plus 12x minus 9. Let me rather do that. Let's do it properly. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, my spacing is a bit off. All right, that was the first derivative, right? Now, when we solved for x, we got our two turning points. We got the x values of 1. And the other x value was 3. Right? Now guys, also, if they're asking you to use the first derivative test, you can only, you only need to test one of your two x values. Because if you're getting a local maximum for the one, then the other one will have to be the local minimum. Right? So don't do the work twice. So which one do we want to test? x equals one. All right? <laughs> I thought so. All right. So four x equals one. That now means that we need to do a number line. All right, we're going to have x equals 1 on this side. And we know that at this point, our first derivative is 0. You don't have to write it in, but you can if you want. Now, guys, the easiest value on the left of 1, I mean, 0, surely, on the left, on the left, <laughs> 0. OK, so now we're subbing x equals 0 into our first derivative. And what are we going to get? Negative 9. So that will give us a? negative value in other words on the left of this turning point the graph is decreasing the gradient is negative right and we do see that on our actual graph okay this graph on the left of one is decreasing on the right of one let's choose two for example so if we sub two in there um yeah we can do it easily but obviously it will have to be positive all right Now, what does that mean? 
Negative, so decreasing, then you have your point, then increasing. So that will have to be a local minimum. All right, therefore, local min. And that's what you'll have to do. So the one at x equals one is local minimum, and then the one at x equals three would be the local max. As I'm going to say again, you only do this if they specify, right? Otherwise, you're going to waste your time. And if they're just asking you to draw the graph, you don't need to know before actually plotting your points which one is local min and which one is local max, right? You just plot them, and then you can also, if they're asking you after the sketch the graph question, you just look at your actual graph. Okay, so that's the first derivative test. The second derivative test. Now for that, we obviously need the second derivative. So we'll do f dash dash of x. That is negative six x plus 12. Now we're going to sub in x equals one again. So you can write it like this, f dash dash of one, or you can just say x equals one. <clears throat> So that's negative six times one, which is negative six plus 12, six, which is positive, meaning that it is lying on a concave up part, right? Meaning that it has to be the local minimum. So you can write there, therefore concave up, but that's just kind of for your understanding. You won't get a mark for saying that, therefore local min. And then again, the other one will automatically be the local max. <clears throat> okay, let's see how much time we left. Half an hour. Hey guys, are there any questions on that? And I read through this whole textbook. The only thing that you need to know in terms of second derivatives really is that it gives you the point of inflection. You can make it equal to zero. that you test for concavity using the second derivative and you can use the second derivative test to get which turning point it is. All right, it doesn't actually go into more detail than that. What we need to do now is how to do some calculations from the graphs, how to find the equation of a cubic graph, for example. So that is the new heading. Let's say, Finding the equation of a cubic graph. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm not going to redraw this diagram. Um, I'm just going to say example one on page 221. This is not obviously in the textbook. Um, I'll show you the picture, obviously, <clears throat> and we'll write down the information that's given. So they're telling you the diagram shows the graph of this f of x is negative x cubed plus a x squared plus b x plus c. Then they're telling you that you have two turning points. The one turning point is a and they're not giving us those coordinates, but they are giving us the coordinates of b. B is the point six zero. 
So guys, do we notice that six zero is also an X intercept? Now, what did we discuss yesterday? If you have an X intercept, that is also a turning point, then it's actually a, can anyone remember? A, a, dub, a double X intercept is what I'm looking for. <laughs> yes, the graph will look like that at that point. All right, but if you're calculating your X intercept and you're getting the same X value twice in that actual calculation, then it will be a double X intercept. So it will be a turning point as well. So we know that already just by looking at the coordinates. So that means that this is in fact a double X intercept. Then they're saying, so when you're solving for X in that equation, you're gonna get two brackets given you six. <clears throat> Remember from yesterday? Um, yeah, we don't know what A is. No, they didn't give us the coordinates of A. Um, this is what I need to write double X intercept here. Yeah, when we did yesterday's example, when we found our X intercepts, we got X minus one, that bracket twice. So we actually only got two X intercepts, but because it's a cubic graph, we're supposed to get three solutions for X. But x equals one was like a double solution and equal that equal root thing from grade 11. Right, so that's what I mean by a double x intercept. Then when we calculated our turning point, we saw that that was actually one of our turning points as well. And that will always happen. If your one x intercept is a double x intercept, so it appears in two brackets there, then it will actually also be a turning point. Okay, they didn't tell us what a is, that turning point. But they are saying, let me just get back to this, graph passes, sorry, I'm just leaving out all of this, <laughs> graph passes through origin. Mm -hmm. And we know that the origin is the point zero, zero. And if we have the point zero, zero, they're saying that the graph goes through that point, that is an X intercept and it is also a Y intercept at the same time, right? If you have the point zero, zero. So this is X intercept and Y intercept. All right, for A, they're asking us to determine the values of A, B, and C. I will show you the graph just now, just so that you can see it. Now, guys, what I want you to notice in this equation that they've given us, the A that they're using here is not the same as our standard form A. All right, in the standard form, the A is a coefficient of X cubed. Now they're actually telling us what that is. Do we see? They've actually shown us that that is negative one. The A that they're using here is a coefficient of X squared, all right? So in this case, what is the shape of the graph supposed to be? If this value is negative, then it's gonna go down first, all right? Now they did give us the graph, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> okay, so the diagram shows the graph of this, there's the equation with turning points at A, so we can see they haven't given us any information about A, and B, which is 6, 0, so there on the graph we can actually see that it's also a, an X intercept, all right? But guys, even if they didn't give us the graph, if they're telling us that the turning point is 6, 0, we need to be able to look at those coordinates and recognize, because the Y value is 0, it's also an X intercept. Right, and in fact, because it's one of the turning points as well, it will be a double X intercept. That's very important. The graph also passes through the origin. There we can see it goes through zero, zero. So that is our other X intercept, and it's also our Y intercept. First question, determine the values of A, B, and C. This is also gonna come in later where they're giving us the X value of T is three. Okay, but that's not really important now. Okay, the values of A, B, and C. Now guys, if we're looking at this equation, C will be the y-intercept, which is zero. zero, good. So there we have C already. C equals zero, I'm just gonna put in brackets here. 
the y-intercept. That's how we know that. <coughs> Now guys, if they had just asked us to find the equation of this graph, all right, that's basically what they're doing when they ask us to find A, B, and C, because once we have A, B, and C, we have the equation of the graph. Now I want you to remember when we did parabolas in grade 11, maybe grade 10, A, B, I can't remember, finding the equation of a parabola, there were three different forms that you could write the parabola equation in. It was the standard form, which is just AX squared plus BX plus C. Then there was turning point form, right then there was x intercept form which was your bracket for your one x intercept and your bracket for your second x intercept and then we just multiplied that out we had an a on the outside though if you guys remember now they've actually given us the a value the traditional first number is negative one now guys for a cubic graph we can do the same thing so i want you just to write here x intercept form this is now of a cubic graph looks like this. <clears throat> this is almost like a note inside an example, sorry. <clears throat> we will draw a little box around it just so that we have a note actually. <clears throat> now guys, this x1, x2 and x3, those are your x intercepts. Right, does this look familiar? We've done it already with a parabola, but then we only had two brackets. All right, because for a parabola, you will only ever have at most two x intercepts. Now we have a cubic graph. We could have at most three x intercepts. All right, because it's x to the power of three. So we're putting our three brackets there. And if we don't know what a is, in this case, they did tell us that a is negative one. But if they didn't, we would have to leave that there and then sub in another point once we've put in our three x intercepts. Right, then we would have to sub in another point in our y and x values to calculate a. Right, I'm just going to write here x1, x2, and x3 are x intercepts. Now I'm drawing a box around that. That is not actually a part of this example. All right, that's just a little note. <clears throat> Okay, so that you need to know, guys. Right, that is a way of finding the equation of a cubic graph. So now, if we're using that, we can say y is equal to negative, right? My a value is negative one. They've told us that already. Now, what are my three x intercepts, guys? Zero and six and six. So, how can I write that? So x minus six, x minus six, and the third one, how will I get x equals zero? This was an x, hey, so you're gonna have x, x minus six, x minus six. So do we notice that product? If we now have to make this equal to zero to find the x intercepts, we would get x equals zero, and then we would get a double x intercept at six. Yeah. Um, because it's a turning point as well. Here they're telling us that it's a turning point. All right, so here I'm just going to write above the two x minus six brackets. That is the double x intercept because it is also a turning point. And this x is coming from zero, zero. So guys, if zero, zero wasn't one of the x intercepts, say it was negative two, we would have x plus two, x minus six, x minus six. All right. Now, if we want to get our a, b, and c values, I know we already have c, but we still need a and b. How can I rewrite this? What must I do to get it in that form? Multiply out, hey? So now we're going to say equals, let me just put the y again because there's something there. Once you have this, you're basically just going to multiply it out. So we have our negative x 
X minus X squared, I'm just going to do that one first. X squared minus 12 X plus 36. Right, so I've just multiplied the x minus six, x minus six first. And now I'm gonna multiply that negative x into it. Negative x cubed plus 12 x squared minus 36x. And that is actually the equation, guys. Do we notice that c is zero? So even if we didn't recognize it at the beginning, we could still find the equation and then we'll see that our c value is zero. Now we've already written that at the top, but we still need to say what A and B are equal to because that is what they're saying in the question, right? They want the values of A and B explicitly. So our A value, if we're using this form that they've given us is 12. And our B value is negative 36. Okay, <clears throat> um, actually, don't think I'm gonna do the rest because it's all like stuff that you can do already. The next question B is to find the coordinates of A. I rather wanna give you time to work in class. So if we have this equation, now they find, they're asking for the coordinates of A, the other turning point. What do we do to find the coordinates of a turning point? Derivative equal to zero, all right? We'll get two answers, we'll get six, x equals six and the other one will then be a, right? For c, they're then asking for the coordinates of the points of inflection. What do we do for that? Second derivative equal to zero, solve for x. Then we sub that x value into this equation to get y, right? Then for d, they're asking for the y coordinate of the point t if the x coordinate is three. Now guys, they're telling you that the x value of this point is three. How will you get the y value? sub x equals three into the equation. All right, you can look at, then they're asking about tangents and stuff. You can look at this whole example in the textbook. It's all worked out beautifully. All right, I don't wanna waste your time now. I think you guys are actually fine with these questions. I rather wanna give you time to work on the homework in class, but it is on page 221 if you wanna go look at it. So exercise 9.3. It starts on page 224. <clears throat> I want you to do numbers. Hmm. One, two, and four. Okay, you can start doing that now. Yes. Hold on quickly. I'm just looking for my remote again. I'm surprised. Is it readable somewhere? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Is it in my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the white one. Okay, um, I'll, I'll find it now, I suppose. <laughs> Let me just okay, there we go. Thank you. 